when you do what you love, you're a success and it's amazing. And a lot of people don't do that. So you have to appreciate that. You know, it's definitely not as glamorous as it seems. I have a lot of people from my hometown who think I've made it because they've seen my movie on television. Oh, Jen Sharp went to LA and she's making money and she's making movies. And yeah, that's Jen. Little do they know, like, I can't pay my bills every month. I've never earned a dime making a movie. I chose filmmaking because it's all I've ever wanted to do. And I've always loved telling stories and making people think, making people question their life and making people question their view of the world. So very similar to Spike Lee, he was really inspirational to me when he came up. Um, I, I was still wanting to be a filmmaker at that point. And he, his use of like just making people passionate and making people question and making people angry and being bold and not being afraid was just completely inspiring to me. And that's the kind of filmmaker I always wanted to be. Box is a short film about the baggage that we carry around with us. So it's called, it's called Box and it's this woman who literally carries this box around with her everywhere she goes that she does not let go of, that gets in the way of everything, which represents everything we carry around with us. So it's cool, it grows, it stops her from doing things she wants to do, um, it's in the bed with her and her husband. Um, so it's really, I'm actually super proud of that film. Uh, it's all me, I directed, produced, wrote, edited, marketed, I mean, I did everything. So I'm really proud of the film and it's, and I think it's really good. Like I, it turned out a lot how I wanted it to. I mean. I'm, very happy with it. I had a twenty to fifty thousand dollar range because I wanted to shoot it on film and I wanted it to be good and um, so I decided that if I could get two thousand people to give me ten dollars I would raise twenty thousand dollars. So I spent a year and a half asking everybody I ever met for ten dollars and um, it took me a year and a half and I would call them and if I just met you I'd be like oh by the way I'm fundraising and then I'd hand you this postcard and I had a postcard which was me sitting on the streets of New York City and a cardboard sign begging and it said we'll shoot for food and it's like as a beggar but it points them to the website where they can donate online where I have my budget completely marked out I had clips of my previous work I had, it was a very legitimate website and I always had these postcards and gave them to people and um, basically did it for a year and a half and then also went through my whole life and like thought about everybody I had ever met and wrote them down and tracked them down online and called them and literally I'd be on the phone with someone for an hour to get ten dollars out of them so I mean it was I was you know and then uh, you know some people would give more which was great and it took a while but I ended up raising nineteen thousand wow. dollars yeah so so did you guys buy your tickets yet what Nothing. Uh, Grace just invited a few of us over to her beach house for a long weekend. Really? When? Sorry, I thought you were going. Why wouldn't Grace invite me? Gee, I really wonder why. Why? Why? Why, Olivia? C come on. Maybe she forgot. <laughs> yeah, right. I think I'm kind of starting to find my voice as a filmmaker, and I'm realizing that I'm more of a comedian than I am drama. So that's been really helpful to kind of see how people like Monty Python and Terry Gilliam and stuff like have comedies but still make really strong points. And then I realize that that makes it even easier to reach people because people like to see comedies. So, my first feature film is I'm Through With White Girls, and it's a romantic comedy. It was written by Courtney Lilly, and the producer found it and um, brought me on to direct it. It's about a black guy <laughs> who's not your, tip not your stereotypical black guy. He doesn't play basketball. He doesn't, he likes rock music, and um, he dates white girls because that's his circle. But all his relationships end up failing so he decides it's because of the color of their skin, because he only dates white girls. So he goes on Operation Brown Sugar to date a black girl. Operation Brown Sugar, huh? Yeah, Billy let the cat out of the bag. No, I think you have a point. I think this country is so repressed. Nobody is comfortable talking about sex or race in a frank manner. I remember this one time. I brought this white guy that I was seeing in college home to meet my folks. So we get to my house. 
We walk through the door, and before I can even introduce him to my parents, he takes off his shoes and starts bowing. And then he gets all embarrassed. And somehow it's my fault? My fault for not warning him that I wasn't a stereotype? God, I hate white people. <laughs> Me too. That's a joke. Oh, I get it. Uh, no, you're totally right. People fetishize each other all the time. Everyone wants to be seen as a sexual being. <laughs> Pet peeve? Sexual stereotypes. Like all black men are supposed to be these wild, virile stallions. It's so not true. No? Well, I mean, it can be. It is most of the time, but, but not always, you know. But, but it is. I really liked the theme of the movie, that it dealt with defying stereotypes. And the underlying theme of this movie was not to judge people by what they look like. And just because you're black doesn't mean you have to talk this way or act this way. And just because you're white, just because you're Asian. So there was a lot of really kind of funny little references to that. And I really liked that. So that's what made me want to do it. We won 12 awards that year at the festival circuit. We won best film at ABFF, best film at Hollywood Black Film Festival, best film, I mean, we won 12 awards. I won a best directing award. I was flown around the country that whole year doing press, doing publicity, going to festivals. Um, and then we got distribution and it's been on Showtime. It's, I think Showtime bought it for a year and then it did so well and they were so happy with it that they bought it for another year. So I was like, great, you know, I'm really like, you know, I didn't, I, I planned my career. I did box my short and that led to the feature because I spent $30,000 on Boxed, uh, my, my 12 minute film. And the whole goal was this is going to be my last short film. It's going to be really good quality. And, and it, it did exactly that. It's the producer from Through the White Girls saw Box, loved it, and that's pretty much why I got hired. And so I'm like, this trajectory, this trajectory of my career was just perfect. As a filmmaker and like even as an actor, you're always this close to making it and getting that big paycheck and you're always this close to being on the streets. So it was, you know, and it, like I got, um, I got offered a job after White Girls and it was um, a $3 million budget. And it was basically like a $100,000 paycheck, just like that. And my lawyer was negotiating the fee and um, we were starting to hire a crew and going to New Orleans. And then of course, like four weeks before, three weeks before we were supposed to go to New Orleans to shoot it, like uh, one of the backers pulled out and then it never happened. So, but it was like, I was there. I was like, okay, I'm about to get a huge paycheck. Like this is, you know, this, it was pretty sweet. And then of course it, you know, it didn't happen. And that's what happens all the time. And so I haven't had, I, you know, I shot, I'm through with white girls, maybe four years ago, maybe three, something like three or four years ago. And like, I haven't, and it's just still trying to get that next thing made and that next movie made. What I have found as far as my next project is that I had hoped that after all my success of I'm Through With White Girls, people would be offering me jobs or not that they'd be thrown at me, but I'd get some offers or I'd get a manager who'd be like, okay, let's work on your career or an agent. And you know, that's when they start to get you work. But what I found with every interview I've been on with agents and managers is that their question is, well, what's next? And I'm always like, well, isn't that your job? <laughs> I mean, isn't that your job to find out what's next? So it doesn't work like that. Um, they, you know, they, they want me to have a script. That, so, I mean, and I have scripts I've been writing and I've been writing and people like my scripts and I actually won an award with one, but it was very edgy, just not commercial enough. So everybody wants a commercial script. So I've been like struggling to write a commercial script. So I have just completed my, my most commercial script ever. It's a horror. Thrill, it's a thriller comedy. It's like a thriller horror comedy with a deep meaning. <laughs> so, um, so I actually think that this is the most commercial script yet. And so I'm going to, I'm actually sending it out to some people, like some managers and stuff. Um, but more than that, I'm, I know I have to make it. I'm, so I'm going to make this movie. And this is the movie that I'm trying to get the three million for. And that's where I am. I think the most important thing that an independent filmmaker can have is confidence. It doesn't even matter how good you are. A lot of people are going to be questioning you and the sooner you can get that confidence in yourself and 
confidence to just move forward and trust yourself and know that you're going to make mistakes and there are going to be bad things that happen and every good uh, you know every director that I love has made a bad movie so it's, it's you're going to have your bad times you know you see so many bad movies out there so many bad movies that get made and what will stop you is your insecurities and your fear and other people and just to just have confidence I think.